So welcome. I'm so excited to have the State of Aging in Florida in partnership with the Seminole Chamber of Commerce, who's been exceptional with the Institute for Strategic Policy Solutions all this time. For those of you all who are not aware of what the Institute does, or as we like to call it, ISPS, we are a nonpartisan think tank embedded in the college that was created by Congressman Young. Congressman Young sought to have nonpartisan social, political, and economic programs for the betterment of Pinellas County, and most importantly, across the region, across the state, and Florida, Florida college system. So we're excited to have you and honored to hear. I'm going to moderate the first par portion of the program, which focuses on policy, legal scams, and insurance issues in Florida. And then following that, I am honored to share the stage also with Marianne Fisher, who is the president and CEO of Safe Harbor Elder Care Services, LLC, and she's going to moderate the topics on health and finance. So as you can see, all the business and nonprofits are around and resources. We invite you during the intermission to be as uh, busy as you like to be. And for this time period, and we also invite you to have light food and drinks before we get to the next section. So with that, we're going to begin. And welcome. I met everyone but you before. <laughs> yes. So Jeff Johnson is a proud, I'm going to first start by saying he's a, a proud board member for the Institute for Strategic Policy Solutions. We are honored to have him. He is also, most importantly, the state director of AARP. And we are going to embarrass him today because he was named 42 of the Florida Power 100 um, for the most influential political players in the Sunshine State by the city and the state of Florida. So we're honored to have him with us today. And next we have Representative Deloach, um, the third with Deloach, Hofstra, and Calvinist PA. I hope I said that right. And he is an estate planning and board certified elder law attorney who's going to give us that lens. Thank you and welcome followed by James Nasiri with the Pinellas County Division of Inspector General, Inspector General Second and Guardianship Unit. And then finally to round out our expert panel, we have Kathy Hall with the Integrity Health Insurance, a Humana Market Point Brokerage. Welcome, welcome, and thank you. And thank you audience for your patience today as we navigate this new virtual hybrid space. So the first question we have as we're discussing about this is that, our population is definitely growing rapidly. We are having a titanic geographic shift, if you will. And how do we best prepare for that as our aging population is here and remains and grows? And because you are the state director of AARP, I think I'm going to start with you. Okay, thanks. <laughs> I appreciate it, Kim, and thanks for the opportunity to be here. So um, how do we prepare for the aging of our population? And I think that in Florida, we have had retirement as a major part of who we are since World War II, frankly. It has continued to grow, and I think that while some people have predicted the demise of Florida over the years, we continue to see growth of retirees moving to Florida, as well as people who were smart enough to move here when they were younger, sticking around and retiring, which is great. I think, to answer your question, what are the things we need to do to prepare for that? First of all, the work that the other folks here do on health, legal, and guardianship issues are, is really important, and I think that making sure that people who move down here thinking that retirement was going to be another form of vacation take the steps to be able to age in place, to be able to remain in their home, to be able to be active in their community, and to think about themselves not as people who are from Ohio or New York or Pennsylvania or Wisconsin, but people who are Floridians and engage in their community in really meaningful ways. So AARP, as a nonprofit advocate, works with local governments as well as at the state and federal level to try to figure out how we help people do that as best we can. Do you all gentlemen have any comments on this about how we um, prepare for this growth population since you're both um, in a legal perspective and a legislative perspective dealing with this intimately, I'm sure. I'll speak first. Um, and again, I'm an investigator. I investigate um, guardianship complaints and misconduct. And to Jeff's point about the population growth, that is going to continue and you're going to find more people subjected to guardianships and the courts have to be prepared for that. Um, it's already pretty overwhelming for Pinellas County, and uh, you know, uh, I think it does have to be looked at and addressed to the population growth because if you don't have the proper um, estate planning, which he will get into, uh, you may find more guardianships and you'll need more public servants like myself to audit and investigate this. So yeah, it's, a, it's an issue to be addressed. I agree, it's definitely an issue when you move to Florida 
and you, you think about you've left your past behind, you are going to now enjoy your all your retirement years ideally and uh, have it good, um, enjoy your life now, And but you have to think about how you prepare for the future. And there's the governmental aspects, the, the guardianship aspects, the insurance aspects, but obviously we think about the legal aspects, what are you going to do to prepare? And it's difficult to think about, but now's the time you think about your will or your trust and your power of attorney and all those different things. Um, you may have had documents up north, but now it's time to make them uh, in Florida or look at it from that perspective. It's, it's difficult to get good information. And you find lots of information from your neighbors or from your friends. Um, but ultimately, there's a lot of misinformation out there that all of our people are subject to on a daily basis. So it's just being knowing that you have a, you know, looking for a good attorney, for instance, um, and uh, having the, the, the right relationship so you can ask the right questions. And we try to uh, avoid guardianships with estate planning, but we know that sometimes people, for instance, name uh, the wrong person as their power of attorney or the healthcare surrogate, and the guardianship courts get involved. Um, and it's going to be an overwhelming process for them because it's each case is so complex. Um, but ultimately, having a good relationship with a good attorney is a, one of the key things that you can have. That's a little self-serving, of course, but uh, <laughs> that's the reality. Well, I don't think that's self-serving at all. As um, um, being a person at this time of life, I've had to navigate a family member who just passed away from Alzheimer's. And the issues, if I weren't an attorney myself, I don't know how people navigate them. And issues related to information is just so important. From a healthcare perspective, do you have anything to add to this portion? As, as an insurance agent, you know, I run into people all the time. I'm super healthy. I don't need, you know, drug coverage. Well, yes, you have to forward think into the future. You do need drug coverage. You need everything. You need the medical, the hospital, and the prescription drugs. So you have to forward think into the future and prepare yourself now for insurance needs. And so this question is, again, to all of you all, and I know you've come from different perspectives. However, we are approaching a 2023 legislative session, and when you go and you advocate, and it's interesting, we just had a program on how to um, advocate effectively last week um, here at the campus. What are your priorities, and how do you plan to convey them in a way that you think they will lead to sustainable policy? Just, um, you know, I'm, I'm just a, an elder law attorney, so I only get to see a certain lens of things. But the, if we think about money, obviously with the legislature and how they can spend money, there's um, I, the world which I see is people get dementia and there's not a lot of supportive services for people to, with dementia. That is kind of the number one issue that I see. Um, there's not a lot of money out there. And so people with retire um, have not many money, not much money in assets, um, and they have lower income. And then paying for a good dementia care facility can be six thousand dollars plus a month. And if you retire with fifteen hundred dollars a month in Social Security, how can you pay for that? And Medicaid itself is not very good at paying for dementia care, either at home or even paying for an assisted living facility. So when my own lens, I see what could or should be a priority, at least from a funding perspective, is helping people pay for their dementia care. That's the, the number one thing that I see. And from an investigative standpoint, I'm sure, because that number you said, I didn't hear any oohs and ahs, but it is actual real number, having lived that, is $6,000 a month on average. It is shocking to the average family how they're going to process that, and if their loved ones aren't here or they don't have anyone and they need guardianship services and they need protection from being taken advantage of. Yeah, just to speak um, for our leader, uh, Mr. Ken Burke, he's very passionate on the subject of guardianship, and he's he spearheaded a task force um, in Florida recently with a, a group of shareholders to kind of get a think tank together and kind of wheel it in to get some good policies going forward as the topic here, the population continues to grow. And with that, you know, you would need good policies in the, in the guardianship realm, and, you know, uh, Mr. Burke kind of spearheaded that, and has made some legislative progress, which is very, um, you know, it's progress. It's always progress. Jeff, do you have any yeah. specific initiatives? No, I was just going to say, the, one of the issues that ARP will be working on next legislative session is on that guardianship work that the task force that James just referred to um, really worked on. And I appreciate 
um, uh, Ken's leadership in bringing the county clerks to that. Um, we also are really focused, uh, this goes to Rep's point, on making sure that there's availability of home and community-based long-term care. We certainly need quality nursing homes. We've been working on ensuring that there are high-quality standards for Florida's nursing homes. But at the same time, I, most people, and this may be true in this room and, and through the live stream too, most people would rather stay home than move to a nursing home. And in order to do that, sometimes you're going to need help. And while there are good uh, home health aides out there, there are home and community-based services providers, there's not a lot of help for people who can't afford to pay out of pocket for that. And it is expensive, to your point. So there are state programs as well as the state Medicaid program that have opportunities for home and community-based long-term care. Our experience is that there are way more people waiting on a list to get those services than there are actually receiving those services. And that's something we'd really like to change this year. So those are the primary things we focus on at ARP. We also do a lot of consumer work, so just keeping, uh, trying to keep your utility bills low, those sorts of consumer protection type things. Um, we try to be a voice not only for those who are already retired, but for, for really all Floridians. Thank you. Kathy, did you want to add? Thank you. Yes, in my office, I actually help a lot of people qualify for Medicaid, low-income subsidy, as well as food stamps. In order to qualify for Medicaid, a married couple has to make less than 2000 a month. And that's really hard to do. So I do see a lot of people where I, I can't necessarily help because of the uh, current standards with the Medicaid program. If I can jump back in, because I know a couple of the rest of the panel were saying, well, I, I don't really do that. You know, the lobbying stuff will leave to, I guess, me. But I think what's really important is that elected officials hear from you, from you as professionals and, and what you see every day, as well as for you who are here, because ultimately they're your elected officials. They're the people that you put in office, and they need to know what issues are bothering you, what issues are keeping you from aging you know with comfort and peace and and uh what things are keeping you up at night and worried so i appreciate what you're sharing i think it's really important for our elected officials to hear that too and i know that st p college just recently did a forum on how to advocate which i, I would commend thank you so much um we try to do these forums often because people don't understand how powerful their voices are and we're at a space in our county at least for now where leadership primarily lives in our county or is from our county so it's nice to go back and make sure you connect those dots and you speak to them when they're home and you share um, your concerns or what you want from the people who represent you. And speaking of that, one of our questions, since you mentioned it, is opinions, not personal, but professional from your organizational standpoint on the expansion of Medicaid in Florida. Difficult question. I have silence. <laughs> silence. We can't advocate before the session. Look, I think... Um, <laughs> So, I, so ARP has supported the expansion of Medicaid, um, no doubt. I, I, we go into each legis legislative session trying to figure out what we can get done and how we can help Floridians. And generally speaking, for the last number of years, I don't know, last 10 years perhaps, there has been resistance to expanding Medicaid in Florida. Our feeling is that getting more people health care is for the good. Um, and so we would rather do that by expanding Medicaid or through whatever other ideas the state of Florida may have to offer. But what we don't want, and, and what I think happens a lot, is people get to 65 and qualify for Medicare, and they have a lot of deferred maintenance on their body. There are a lot of things that they needed to take care of that they waited, and I see the Medicare folks nodding their heads. They're like, they get to 65, and all of a sudden, it's time to do the knees and the hips and all the things. and and um, And... And unfortunately, that means that they spent probably four, five, six years not living very healthy lives and not really enjoying life as much as they could because they didn't have the access to the health care that they needed. So we need to figure that out. And if expanding Medicaid were an option that helped us get there, then great. I, I don't know that it is. I'm, I'm not going to be a prognosticator, but it would be, it would be new if there was. I would say, too, on the flip side, and this may be something that um, – that you all have opinions on too, we need to figure out how to bring more healthcare professionals and more healthcare into Florida. So uh, across our economy right now, it seems like everybody is hiring for everything, but um, we have real concerns about doctors, nurses, certified nursing assistants, um, therapists. We need all of those because as you said at the beginning, Florida's aging population is growing and we are the ones who most use those services. So finding ways to continue to grow those professions in Florida is really important. I was just speaking over the weekend with a friend who happens to be one of the lead experts at Emory, and hiring 
is the number one issue that they're having in the system, in a system that's bleeding for um, significant care for basic services, for CNAs, for home health care aides, and for people who trust, that are trusted individuals that we're not necessarily providing the financial resources to sustain um, you know, good employment, uh, good employees. With that being said, I would love to hear both of y'all speak in tandem about the process. So someone who comes and they want to understand um, estate planning, what, they, what should they do? And then on your side, yeah. what should they look out for as they're going into this process? I think to your point about Medicare, but on a different level, people don't think about this stage of life, not purposely. It just sort of happens quickly to a lot of us. And then when we get to that stage or our loved ones get to that stage, we have not, even though we might even have access to understand, we haven't done all the work that is required to prepare for the stage and unexpected illnesses and challenges. So if you can speak to preparation, you can speak to um, how you support the community. Sure, I will definitely defer to the subject matter expert first on the, on the matter, and I'll just give an investigator's inspect, uh, perspective afterwards. Well, I think we all know, um, obviously, there's some point in our life where um, we are going to uh, pass away course and but we, we think about estate planning is preparation for our death and whether we have a will or whether we have a trust but also very very important when you go see an estate planning and or elder law attorney you also talk about your incapacity planning so that means you always make sure you do your durable power of attorney and that's going to be who's going to make your financial decisions in the event you became incapacitated or you um, just get dementia or something to that effect you name your designation of health care surrogate who is going to make your health care decisions. You always do your living will. Um, what would your end of life wishes be if you're unable to make your own decisions? And in some ways, these things are very elementary, basic decisions, but people put off making those decisions. And for instance, even though you're married doesn't mean that you actually gave a husband and wife your marriage does not um, actually give you a power of attorney. So there are times when people become incapacitated, they're married, and their spouse does not even have a power of attorney. They cannot manipulate finances, and that means a guardianship may need to be done if someone becomes incapacitated without creating a power of attorney. Um, so even a marriage does not provide that. So sitting down with a good attorney and reviewing those different options, and in the most important thing and most difficult area, sometimes, you know, I, I name my spouse as my power of attorney, um, and then I, my son lives in town, he's trustworthy, he's trusted, and he lives in town, and he's, he's the alternate to the power of attorney. In some ways, it can be very easy decision-making. You name each other, then you name your next trusted child. But when the guardianship arena comes about, and we, he sees more things than I see on a daily basis, but ultimately sometimes people don't have a trusted individual they can name. Or they, so they, they don't have a son they can name, they don't have a trusted daughter, sometimes their neighbor may take advantage of them. Um, so it is difficult to figure out if you don't have a trusted person in your life that you can name to make your financial decisions or make your health care decisions. Um, but you, it's always sitting down with a good attorney and talking about what your options are, um, not put, putting it off, not kicking it down, the, the kicking the can down the road. It's very easy to procrastinate on all these different things. Um, and what happens is effectively, you, the best laid plans, you generally can avoid a guardianship under most but not all circumstances. Um, and so we do good estate planning where you can avoid the guardianship arena. Um, and guardianship arena, um, you get to see the probably, I don't say the worst of the worst, but you get to see situations where people didn't do planning or they name a good power of attorney and their power of attorney dies or um, they name the power of attorney who happens to be their next door neighbor who wants to steal their house or something like Don't that. Don't forget the families that feud. When the families feud over who's the power of attorney, usually the end result, the court gets involved. So. Yes, uh, my stomach just turned over, so thank you. <laughs> um, I, I don't, our office does not investigate Medicaid fraud. We have connections with the state of Florida Office of Inspector General for that. But I could say how it relates to guardianship in Florida with the population issue. There's a lot of indigent folks that are just kind of floating in the hospital system. They kind of get three hots in a cot. They return to the hospital. And we've had investigations where it will come, and we work with the state of Florida too, Department of Elder Affairs, OPPG, Office of Public and Professional Gardens, we work with them as well. So we'll get complaints saying that this hospital is paying a professional guardian a kickback, you know. And when we actually look into it, we see it's not illegal, it's not a kickback. You know, if you look at the policy of hospitals, you know, 
healthcare in general, it's a drain on the economy, and it's kind of just an economic model where it's kind of like a finder's fee. They will pay a professional guardian to take this um, person who's in the hospital system to place them in a guardianship, get their, um, you know, their, their personal affairs in order, uh, find them a place to live, and the hospital sometimes will pay them a fee to do that. And we've looked at it, we've got opinions, it's not a crime, it's not a kickback. It's an economic model to kind of alleviate the healthcare system, getting individuals in a guardianship and squared away and out of the hospital. Totally fine. But back to the Medicaid, these people are usually, these folks are usually on Medicaid. That's the only way I could kind of relate to that. You all have any comments about that? Jeff, no? Um, well, no. I mean, I think that we've heard of horror stories in other parts of the state and country of guardians who have really not acted on the best interests of their clients. And I think that's the thing that we're most concerned about and figuring out how to prevent. But I think that the, the guidance on finding a good elder law attorney and having those conversations and putting your affairs in order, putting your documents together avoids all of that. But it's hard for us to do that. It's not that it's, um, I mean, it's not that we don't all know that the mortality rate of the human race is 100%, but we'd like to think that ours is not for a while, and, and now is the time. We tend to hear it's folks who have just taken care of mom or dad who will, who will take that step, because it's usually so awful for the caregiver that they think, I am not doing that to my kids, and that's when they tend to find, uh, seek out an elder lawyer. I, I would also say too, that just as finding good information is so important in that arena, it's also super important for those who are especially becoming eligible for Medicare. And I don't know how many of you have already been through uh, turning 65 and having to pick a plan, all those sorts of things. I know people with multiple degrees at the end of their name who struggle to figure out A, B, C, D, yeah, and what exactly they want to do. And so talking to people who have expertise at that, I think, is just really important. As, as a Medicare agent, I do. It's not uncommon for me to get a phone call from one of my clients' daughter or son asking if they can make a change to their policy or update a primary care doctor. Well, it's, it's not easy to do unless you have power of attorney, have something set up, something in place. Um, our agents in our office, we are licensed, we're trained, we sit down with everyone, we thoroughly explain the whole Medicare process, what's the difference between a Medicare Advantage plan or a supplement? You can't have both. So it's something important to maybe even sit down with your parents and help, help pick the best plan for your parents. So I would say I fall into the category you just said. Um, being somewhat able to navigate a space, um, my family had a situation where a relative wasn't trusted, I was named. Now, nearly three years later, and I had a board-certified elder law attorney, and I have my own independent knowledge as an attorney, I can tell you navigating these waters are very challenging, and I immediately updated everything. <laughs> I mean, everything. Just followed suit one by one. Because it is extremely challenging when the worst-case scenario happens and you don't have anything in place. And I would say the, the best advice that was given to me by the elder attorney that I hired at least is, um, unlike in prior generations, you can really educate yourself. You can spend some time, you know, really educating yourself before it gets to that space. So I want to get to some of the last couple of questions. You know, with this titanic geographic shift I talked about in the beginning, do you think that Florida is a good place to retire? I know, at least in our county, the cost of living has escalated to really, for most people, an excessive rate. So I have neighbors who have lived there their entire lives, but now they can't afford the same quality of life that they had for their entire life, and they're trying to figure out, where do I go? Um, so again, as the expert in this area, are you still advocating for people to come down here, age out, and retire? I, I, that's a good question. <laughs> um, and there have been points in the past where we've thought about, do we put like a, okay, we're full sign? Um, <laughs> um, but, or, or just a warning side, just beware, you're moving to Florida. Um, I, people are still gonna retire to Florida. Uh, anybody I talk to, and I would be curious from this audience, I think a couple of you maybe have retired to Florida. Um, people tend to say the weather is so much better, I, I am so happy not to shovel snow, and it's um, less expensive than where I came from. 
And as long as those two things are true, as long as it is cheaper than somewhere, people are going to come from there. As long as the weather is good, people will come down. The, the only time we really saw that dip was the, the span where we had a bunch of hurricanes at one time. And at that point, people said, you know, North Carolina, you don't get a lot of hurricanes, uh, although they eventually got some too, but, um, or Tennessee. But um, so that's, people are going to continue to retire here. That's not the question. The question is, is it a good place to retire? And what I would say is it is if you plan for it, if you go in with eyes wide open. Again, I think most people think of retirement as an extended vacation. And there's certainly some joy to that. But the reality is you're moving to a new place. You're moving to a new community, and you need to put roots down in that community. You need to develop friendships. When the storms come, whether they be literal or metaphorical, we all have to look out for each other. And that's hard to do if we don't know each other. So I, I would encourage you to consider if you have recently uh, retired to Florida, or I guess if you're watching the live stream, you could be somewhere else plotting to come down here. Don't just come here as a tourist. Come here as a new resident and really engage in this community. Definitely, Florida is a very good place to retire when it comes to health insurance. You can't find plans like we have here in Florida. We have zero premium Medicare Advantage plans and most plans refund money back. I actually have a client. She's on a plan where she's getting a refund back into her social security check. Notified me that she's moving to Maryland went to Maryland, now she does have to pay the 145 out of her social security check in addition to the cost of a supplement and a Medicare prescription drug plan. So she's looking at an extra $400 per month because she moved to a state that wasn't rich with Medicare Advantage plans. So here in this area, specifically Greater Tampa Bay, you will not find plans for Medicare as rich as Florida. Um, the plans work by concentration, so Medicare concentration. The, the more Medicare eligibles condensely populated in an area, the better the health plans. So I believe for health insurance purposes, yes, Florida, more specifically Pinellas County and Hillsborough County, it's a very good plan to live. Yes. Yes. From, from my own perspective, um, the, one of the things is as we age, we, we've already mentioned is we all want to stay home as long as we possibly can. Um, and what I always say to people is we want to stay home as long as we can. We want to live as independently as possible as we age. And then we don't want to wake up one morning, many years in the future, right? We don't want to go downhill. We don't want to get dementia. We don't want to end up in the nursing home. Uh, none of us want to have that. But we do know, just for instance, in the, the state of Florida, if you did need Medicaid, Medicaid effectively, there's a wide, we've mentioned the term Medicaid, it's a, uh, many different contexts. It's there for, it's a health insurance program to help the needy. And in, in the elder law world, it helps a lot with a, the long-term care side of things. And the long-term care side of things, you'd roughly say it's not very good with helping people stay home. If you get dementia, a Medicaid can provide a roughly twelve to $1,500 a month subsidy to pay for in-home caregivers. That's not a lot. Twelve to fifteen hundred dollars a month for in-home caregivers, or even twelve to fifteen hundred dollars a month for an assisted living facility, and we said that that can already be very, very expensive. But one thing we do know is that the state of Florida, very interestingly, is if you have your home, um, the state of Florida will never take it away. So you can always provide a um, legacy for your children if you do run, want to retire to the state of Florida. And if, even if you do Medicaid, need Medicaid and long-term care, you can always own your home of up to $635,000. And the state of Florida can never take it away upon your passing. So through my own particular lens, um, some states, they literally make you sell your home in order to get Medicaid. Um, some states are very restrictive when it comes to that, but at least through the lens of long-term care, none of us want long-term care, but it's also, at, frankly speaking, it's a very um, good way to preserve um, a legacy for the children if that's a goal. It may or may not be your goal, but that's actually the way that looks works in Florida. And speaking from strictly personal preference, I was born and raised in New Jersey where my family paid fifteen to $16,000 in just property tax. And I'm always lobbying for my friends and family to move down here to retire. It used to be, you know, I have a lot of friends and family that are just on Social Security. Well, a Social Security check will go much further in Florida than it will in New Jersey or New York. It's kind of changing now, but I'm always a proponent of moving down here. You know, there's many opportunities, um, and it's, it's always a plus, you know, to be in the sun. That's, that's my position. 
Well, we're going to be wrapping up soon, and I want to ask for your best advice as we close and pivot, giving you all the opportunity again to see the wonderful vendors that we have here. Um, I'm going to say my best advice is something that I just thought of as you were speaking, and that is a while ago you had introduced a tool, uh, maybe four or five years ago I'm going to say, and the tool was like, and, and please correct me if I uh, describe it wrong, basically you put in your zip code and you put in um, what your preferences are and your ARP tool shares with you exactly metrics. You know, and the metrics, I don't know if we can pull it up for you all, but I would advise you to plug it in your phone. It's quite an interesting tool that sh shares a lot of important data, if it's still up, about what's going on in the communities that you choose to live in. Sure. Okay, great. Yeah, I'll take that because um, I didn't know what advice I would give. So the AARP, uh, AARP Livability Index, which is what Kim was just referring to in... I would say just look up ARP Livability Index. It'll come up. You put in your zip code, you can put in your address, county, whatever you want, and it'll, it'll show you how your community stacks up against everybody else in the country on a variety of things. Um, on the environment, on transportation, on housing, on the economy, all of those things. And you can kind of go in and play and say, well, I don't really care about this as much as that. But it gives your community a score, which is wonderful because every elected official thinks that their community should be a 100. Um, on a scale of zero to 100, and nobody is. Everybody has room for improvement. No place is perfect. Uh, and Florida tends to be middle of the pack, tends to be around here. I think it's usually most communities are in the low 50s, high 40s, which is not bad. It's just uh, for elected officials, that sounds like room to grow. Um, I would also say that there are a lot of other tools on the ARP website. There's a lot for family caregivers. There's a lot for navigating Social Security and Medicare questions. But uh, since you asked for advice, I would say the advice I would have is use the time between panels to get to know the people who are at the tables around here. Because in addition to the tools we have, which I'd be happy for you to come use, they're all free. You don't have to be an ARP member, although it's a very affordable membership at $16 a year. <laughs> You've got people here who are professionals who spend their lives helping people navigate the, the really tricky topics of Medicare, of long-term care, of how to manage guardianship, of all the other, on staying healthy, which I know is the whole next panel. Use that, use that opportunity, which I suspect is why you're here. Thank you. I would also say that there is a guardianship tool, too, that I passed around about four or five years ago that was very useful. Kathy. My advice to seniors would be to never give your information over the phone. <coughs> you may think Medicare is calling you, but they're not. So if Medicare or Social Security needs to get in touch with you, they will mail a document to you. So they do not ever make outbound calls. On a daily basis, I get calls all the time. You know, I don't know what happened. My plan just changed. I was talking to Medicare and updated my policy. No, it's, it's not. It's a, it's a licensed agent over the phone trying to change your plan. So my advice, never give information out over the phone. And if they continue to call you, the Pinellas County Inspector General has a fraud, waste, and abuse hotline, and we could take that call and look into it. That's great advice. We'll have to put that number out on our screen when we digitize the program. Yeah. And, uh, definitely, uh, that, like, that's all great advice. And just plan ahead. Um, create your estate plan, your power of attorney, and all those different things. But not just plan ahead. Make a copy of it and give it to the person that's in charge. Make sure they know where the documents that you've prepared are. Um, it's, it's not just enough to have it in a desk drawer if no one can find it. So, you know, pull out your living will, pull out, pull out your health care surrogate. You know, if these documents are older than 10 years, maybe it's time to sit down and review these things. But again, you know, you've done it, um, but also share it with the, their family members so they already know. Um, so they know if something happened to you, then they're, they're prepared as best as they can to help react and make sure you get the right care in the right place. On our ISPS website, which is isps.spcollege.edu, but um, I'm sure you'll see a lot of uh, information um, in the community. We did a guardianship series um, amid COVID, and we went into great detail about some of the um, nuts and bolts of the processes that might help you have a greater understanding. Um, I would say having just gone through the process, there are things that we don't think about in our new space, which is our digital space. In our digital space, you will not have access no matter how hard you try to get to the phone companies and the companies alike, and we are forced to change our passwords very often. Having a secure place and a person that you trust 
so that you know there's at least a likelihood that you can um, break through these barriers quicker since we no longer have as many paper files as we have digital file files is one of the, you know, I think a large advantage as you're going through the process and finding again someone you trust. With that being said, I trust Ms. Fisher to come and do a wonderful job as we pivot. You're going to have about 15 minutes to network, to have some food, to learn about some of our experts here. And we're so grateful for your time today. We know that you can be anywhere. This is important for us to re-engage and bring you back to the extent you are capable. Thank you so much. Thank you to our panelists for your time and your expertise. Hi there. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are just thrilled to see everybody here. Um, we're bringing all of the resources that or many of the resources that are available in the uh, Seminole community. And uh, we're just thrilled to be here with you. We had a wonderful session for our first session talking about um, the state of Florida and the state of aging and um, all of the different uh, legislative uh, events that are going on. And most importantly, and I can't stress this enough, how important it is that you take control of these decisions that you need to make before something happens. And that you really do need the help of professionals. You, you need to sit down with an attorney and make sure that all of your documents are in order. This avoids winding up in the state system and having a professional guardian assigned to you. Now, while I am a professional guardian and a professional fiduciary, I would still encourage everyone to sit down and think about who do you want to make decisions for you when you really need somebody. So today, I have the pleasure of having some lovely support people that are professional providers in this community. We have with us Dr. Sandra Lilo. We have Dr. Deb Bebel. And we have a financial planner, um, Mr. Mark Vernick. And they all come with tremendous years of knowledge and tremendous resources in this community. And so um, I'd like to introduce everybody. If you could just say a few words, uh, Dr. Lilo, could we start with you? Can you introduce yourself and um, tell us a little bit about you? Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much, and uh, Marianne, and I look forward to being part of this panel today. I am a board-certified naturopathic physician, an integrative biologic dentist, and I've been a dentist for a long time as well. My practice here began in 1989 after careers with the Air Force and also with corporate dentistry. So I have the three doctorates, and it has been a pleasure for me to go ahead and be in the Seminole community for many, many years, and I continue to want to serve some more. Dr. Bevel? Am I on? Yep. Um, actually, it's B-Bell, but that's okay. Oh, <laughs> it's actually B-Bell. We'll get, we'll get that straightened out somewhere along the line. Um, I'm an acupuncture physician. I've been practicing acupuncture for over 25 years. My background before that was critical care nursing. I did open heart, adult, and pediatric. And we came down here for me to go to acupuncture school. We were traveling nurses. My husband's an operating room nurse. And we came down here for me to go to acupuncture school. There used to be a school at 66th and 54th. Um, it was a four-year program that we completed because we went full-time um, in three years. And I've been practicing. We didn't intend to stay in the area, but... Uh, had some nice offers when I first got out of school, and once you're established, it's hard to pick up and leave your practice. Um, so I, um, in practice, I practice up in, right off of Almerton and Starkey, just west of Starkey, in the iSpa Health Studio. And 
wide range of patients anywhere from newborns to 98 years old. So acupuncture is for much more than just pain management, which is what most people think of it being for. But we'll hopefully expand on that a little bit. And I appreciate the fact that ISPS broadened their scope to include naturopathic and uh, traditional Chinese medicine and acupuncture. I guess that's me. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Mark Vernick. I am a local certified financial planner. A um, couple letters after my name, CFP, certified financial planner. Another one, AIF, accredited investment fiduciary. My dumb joke about letters after my name is nobody really cares except the person that has them and their mother, but, um, <laughs> but, but I care, and, and uh, it's something that I spent a lot of time and effort to achieve, and, and hopefully it tells people that uh, I'm serious about my profession. So um, in my 29th year, uh, primarily I like to say we're uh, an investment management firm that also does financial planning. Um, we manage money for individuals and families. We also uh, manage money more institutionally, for lack of a better term, for a trust company, for professional guardians, for people of that ilk, people who I like to say are in charge of other people's money. So somebody who finds himself as a guardian, power of attorney, a trustee, you want to make sure and meet your legal obligations, that you're doing the right thing with those finances. We stand behind that person. I like to say we're the fiduciary for the fiduciary. So that's what we do. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Lilo, can you tell us a little bit about um, the naturopathic uh, medicine? Um, there is a lot of scare out there uh, concerning a lot of issues. One is maybe big pharma is not the way to go. Um, so can you tell us about some approaches that you think work? You're going to start by throwing me under the bus, aren't you? <laughs> no, I just want you to drive the bus. <laughs> Marianne and I have known each other for a long time. She, she knows I have no filter, so I've just got to tell it like it is because that's why I'm here today is to tell you the truth. In 1910, the Rockefeller Foundation uh, integrated itself into medicine. And at that point, the pharmaceutical companies became introduced into mainstream medicine they decided that they would do away with homeopathy and natural medicine, which was a real difficult choice for many, many people because many of our countrymen at that point were farmers. And for those people that are old enough to remember, you know, your, your mom always told you, you know, eat these fruits and vegetables, eat this, do this. And we were never sick as kids. We were always out there. If, if the kid down the street got chicken pox, guess where I was going? So those kinds of things, those kinds of natural medicine tricks seem to have gone ahead and helped me survive to the point that I'm on a Medicare card now. And I have not missed a day of work since 1986, which was my last flu shot. So I'm really into natural medicine. I think that there's a lot of answers today that you cannot find on Mr. Google. You have to go ahead and have better resources than that. And if there's things that you need to find, find a good functional medical practitioner, integrative medical practitioner. They know about nutrition. It's no longer taught in medical school, but it is there and it is there to save your life. And Dr. Bebel. I still said it wrong. Okay. Bebel. There you go. <laughs> oh, I'm going to go to the same question. Um, well, as I mentioned earlier, the, most people think of acupuncture as being for pain management. And it certainly is not just pain management, but most people go to their doctor, something hurts, they get put on medication. And then they get stuck on the medication. And we know what's going on with opioids in the, in the nation as far as that goes. So what if before jumping on your op opioids, you actually came and got some other pain management? Um, acupuncture is not a pill. Um, it actually works on taking care of the cause of the pain. It goes deeper than just taking a pill and numbing you to those sensations. So it, people are going to ask, is it covered by insurance? Most acupuncture and practitioners are not covered by insurance. There's a rumor out there that, um, that acupuncture will now be covered by Medicare. That is for one malady, and that is for low back pain. And only if you've been dealing with it for over six months, 
and you have documentation and the acupuncturist that is going that you're going to be seeing has a plethora of people that is going to do all the paperwork and jump all the hoops um, and then we don't get paid much of anything for that coverage so truthfully it's nice that Medicare started to say, oh, yeah, we should recognize acupuncture. Um, but there's a lot that acupuncture can do for you for pain management, um, digestive issues, allergies. I'm just thinking this morning before I came, thinking of, well, who I saw in my office yesterday. Um, some of it was pain management. Some of it was respiratory. She's, she's post-COVID, still having a bit of a cough, did some cupping on her changes amazingly. The cupping you saw at the Olympics, those hickeys on the back of everybody, that's from cupping and it draws um, the stuck blood and stagnation up to the surface where the body can actually take it away and then new blood goes into that area. So there's a lot of modalities besides just needles that get used with acupuncture and there's also herbs that go with it. So I don't do a lot of herbs. I do have people locally that can do herbs. So if that isn't something that needs to be done, I refer out. And I believe, believe me, if I got hit by a car, don't take me to my acupuncturist. You know, take me to the doctor. But five years ago, I fell and broke both my wrists at the same time. And um, so I was out of work for three months. But yeah, I got taken to the emergency room. And yeah, I have plates and screws in both wrists right now. But it wasn't long before I started getting needles back in myself and getting that circulation going so that I could get back to work. Um, so acupuncture doesn't answer every question, but neither does, um, the, does Western medicine. So the fact that you're here and listening is allowing you to broaden your horizon, so I appreciate that. So there are some questions that are general questions on everyone's mind as far as finances are concerned. We are um, at a time, especially when there's elections coming up, um, that somebody's doing away with Social Security. And for many, many people, Social Security is their lifeline. Um, do you think that Social Security is just going to uh, go away? No. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I definitely do not. So there's, there's two elements of Social Security. There's the money in, right, versus the money out. And the, the statistics that we see and hear all the time are that eventually the Social Security pool is going to run dry. But what is not oftentimes publicizes there's still money's coming in. So I don't know what the current statistic is specifically, but if and when we reach whatever that future date is that keep, they keep projecting, whatever year that is, that Social Security pool runs out. Uh, the last stat I sa saw, if they didn't change anything or do anything, you'd still probably get about 90% of your benefit um, because of the money's coming in. Uh, people are still working, they're still paying into the system. But then my, my personal belief is, um, you know, torches and pitchforks in the street if they took away Social Security, right? It's, it's become integrated in our society such that it is, they talk about different legs of the stool that you need to support yourself on in retirement, and it's become a primary leg of that stool. And the, the uh, cause and effect or the, 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 the results of eliminating Social Security would be catastrophic. So they will figure it out, as you know, with our government officials, they're going to wait until they're right on the edge of the cliff and about to fall off, and we're about to all kick them off uh, the edge, uh, that they'll finally have to do something. But I, I do believe it'll, it'll get to that point. So you're not done yet. Okay. So the next question um, from the audience is that um, there are other concerns, like the stock market. And as we age... Don't we invest differently? Yeah, so um, my wife jokes that she can tell how the market did that day based on my mood when I come home um, as a portfolio manager. But, uh, and so this has been an extraordinarily difficult market for, for two reasons. One is stocks have gone down, right? I think that's pretty obvious. But a lot of us who have these mixed portfolios, right, you hear stocks and bonds. And Bonds, traditionally, we refer to as the airbag for the stock portfolio, right? If your stocks, you have some bonds in there, so if your stocks go down, it helps cushion that, that blow. 
But this year, because interest rates elevated so quickly without getting into a whole explanation why, just know that if interest rates go up, it's usually detrimental to the, the value of your bonds that you hold. So very unusual this year, end of June, uh, stock market, if you use the S&P as the stock market indicator, was down about 20%, depending on what given day it was, which is a bear market. And, but the bond market was also down 10%. So that offset or that cushion, although it was down less, really didn't work as it traditionally does, and it will again. Um, so to more direct answer to your question is, yeah, the, the rule of thumb is the younger we are, the more aggressive we, we invest. The older we are, the more conservative that we invest. But I have clients well into their 90s that have been long-term stock investors that are more upset if the market's up 15 and they only made 10 than, than the inverse, right? And I have younger clients who, if their portfolio was down 4 or 5%, it would literally give them an ulcer, right? So, so it has to be appropriate for the person. To me, what we try and do is build out a portfolio that, and we have statistics that we show people normal ranges and what their expectations should be and downsides are going to happen and what that range would be. But the point is, is it something that you can stay in, right? Because we're all taught all our lives that, you know, the market, you got to hang in there and it'll come back. And of course, the older we get, the, the more we hear, well, I don't have time for it to come back, which, which, is, which can be a true statement. Um, but if you build a portfolio that you can stay in, that's, that the downside is not so egregious that it's going to make you lose sleep. And because and, the worst thing historically we know is when the market takes a big dip, if you get out then, Right? It's usually the worst time to get out and the best time to get in. When, when the masses start to get out of the market, they call that capitulation. And, and when people capitulate, historically, we know that's a bad time to get in. So that was a long way around to say you have to build something that, not that you don't ever change, but the allocation is such that you can stay in when the market does pull back like it has now. Okay, I'm going to add on to that because I have a feeling everybody's a little stressed. And I have to say, I would imagine Dr. Lilo, and definitely for acupuncture, we can help you decrease your stress and help your sleep. <laughs> and by the way, if you've never had acupuncture, it truly is one of the most relaxing things you can do. Uh, I mean, I, I've had, I fell asleep on the table, so there you go. Yeah, I, I remember hearing a story about how do I get him out of my office? <laughs> I can't wake him up. <laughs> Not for me. I didn't tell you that story. Um, from Safe Harbor Elder Care's perspective, um, my goal is to provide resources to make sure that you get answers to your questions, whether it's dealing with something that's happening to you with your family at home, whether it's a question of how do you find out how um, assisted living facilities are rated. How do you know how many people are going to be watching out for your loved one in a long-term care situation in a nursing facility? All of these questions that cross your mind, you do have resources available to you. And if I connect your dots and lead you to that person that helps you out, or if Safe Harbor Elder Care is the solution for you, regardless of what it is, my mission is to make sure that you get answers so that you can make informed decisions, and to let you know that there is a plethora of resources in your community that are more than willing to help you out, have excellent advice, and are reliable. Unfortunately, there are good people and bad people whenever you're in a large community. And so I just want to make sure that you are guided to people that I trust, because I've been in this community and in the healthcare business for almost mm, 30 years. And so I have built very strong foundations in the community with a lot of the organizations. Um, I, I know 
many of the people that are in this room and refer to them on a regular basis. And the reason that I do it is because I know it's right for you. So please make sure, wherever you are, whatever is going on, when you have these questions, don't stand still. Ask, and you'll be led to the information that you need to make the most informed decisions. Are there any questions that are out in the uh, audience? Yes. Uh, so, um, the question is, how hands-on is Safe Harbor Elder Care uh, when it's necessary? And it's 100%. So, it's difficult for me to plan uh, my day. Um, I have a calendar and it has all these great plans of everything that I want to get accomplished that day. And then... Mr. Jones is not answering his phone. And he's somebody that I see, you know, maybe once a week to take care of uh, seeing him, making sure everything is fine. And then the next thing I find out, he's not answering his phone. I have a full day. But you know what? The full day is canceled because something's wrong with Mr. Jones and I need to go there and find out. And it could be that when I go there and find him on his living room floor yelling, Marianne, is that you? Get in here. Help, help. And he has a broken hip. And he looks at you and says, thank God it happened today. I wouldn't have seen anybody. Nobody else would be coming here. So if that is the level of hands-on that my clients need, that is 100% what they get. Does anybody else have any questions for our uh, panelists? Well, I'm ask a question. Certainly. I'm not of myself, obviously. So I'm, I'm a big believer of I don't want to take a pill unless I really need to take a pill, right? If there's no other option for me to take a pill, but how do I find that, I, I guess the term is homeopathic and I think I'm misusing it somehow, but, but the non-Western traditional medica medicine, if I wanna find a physician or a practitioner in those fields, and, and, I, and I know Deb, and certainly if I needed um, acupuncture therapy, that's where I would go. But outside of that, just from a, a broader perspective, how do you find these people? Do you guys, is there a resource that you're aware of? Is there a, a website? How do we? Well, the difference between allopathic or traditional Western medicine and functional or integrative medicine is, is twofold. First of all, allopathic medicine basically is symptom-based medicine. You've got a stomach ache, we'll give you this pill. You've got a broken leg, this is what you need for surgery. So that's pretty much symptom-based. Uh, functional medicine or integrative medicine says this is this whole person let's take a look at what's going on because this person came to me and said hey I don't feel well I don't really know what's wrong but you know what all of a sudden I'm on 10 medications I don't even know why I'm on some of these things and I just feel like garbage I don't even want to leave the house so a functional medical practitioner would go and take a look at you and 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 take maybe a series of tests and say well this isn't working in your body, this isn't working, this isn't getting processed, your food isn't becoming digested. So they take a look at that and then they start to peel back the onion. And they say, all right, it's not, let's go ahead and give you a name and say, hey, you've got diabetes. They'll, they'll take a look and they'll say, well, why? What happened? Because it's really not genetics. I've got news for you, we all have genetics. But it's not genetics that causes disease, it's epigenetics. It's those things that we do on a regular basis that cause this. So if you'll notice that during the pandemic, a lot of times people were so stressed out and they were so fearful, they were eating a box of Krispy Kreme donuts. 
So here you go. You know, they're not having a salad, they're having Krispy Kreme. Well, you know, what does that do? I don't know that anybody in this room doesn't know, but they're going to go ahead and need to find out why that blood sugar is high and why they feel like garbage. So they can go to functional medicine practitioners that you can actually put it in a web search and say natural practitioners, um, herbalists, all of these people are connected by a very tight network. Most things that Deb knows, um, they know who she is. She knows who functional medical practitioners are. I know as a naturopath who other people are. And I can name off probably half a dozen just off my, uh, off my head who could do, go ahead and see these people. So they are around. You just have to be very deliberate and look for it. And I'm going to add to that as far as look at the training. Um, I mentioned I went to a four-year program that we completed in three um, MDs can do acupuncture with a week course, one week, and chiropractors can do it with 100 hours. So be aware of what the training is. I'm not saying that what they're doing is wrong, um, but it's not cookbook. You really have to be able to differentiate as far as the diagnosis goes. And I have a foot on the west. I did critical care. I understand that. But now I have a good solid foot on the east, the eastern side of it. And so I get to look at the whole picture. I know what the medications are you're coming in with. Um, it might be a new name, but I look it up and I understand it because I understand the Western side of it also. Um, as far as being able to refer out, that's the catch. I mean, we know people and we know people that we would trust. And um, so that's, it's, and I'm, you know, if I can't take you, I'm the first one to refer you out to somebody else. Um, and that's what we need to be able to do and to expand it. And just to say, I'm sure Sandra's the same way, we spend a lot of time with you. My first visit is close to two hours, um, and my follow-ups are an hour and a half. And I don't, like, just put the needles in you and walk out of the room. I do one patient at a time. And so I get to know my patients. I know what's going on. Sometimes I wish I could, like, move it along a little faster. But, I mean, people come in, they sit down, they expect to talk to 50, for 15 minutes because i got to know what's going on with them. But that matters. China, In China, ancient China, the doctors were preventative. You use the medicine preventatively. That's a mindset we don't have anymore. We don't go to a doctor unless we have something wrong with us. Or annually we go and they do the checklist because you need that for Medicare. But they don't get to know who you are because you're only in the office for seven minutes because that's all the time they can do to be able to get overhead covered. Um, so be aware of what you're looking for and what you need. Any questions? Deb said, go for it. Okay. So here we go. So all of a sudden, I'm, pardon? So the question was, how did COVID impact our lives and the changes that happened thereafter? So I sold my practice in July of 2021. And as a dentist who'd been practicing for over 40 years, I have practiced in spit and blood for over 40 years. When I went into dental school, we didn't use gloves. We didn't use masks. And I did extractions barehanded. So those kinds of things that terrified many, many people, and I was coming back from France and I had to quarantine only because I was coming back from France, not because I was sick, a lot of this stuff became a very fear-oriented push and, and, and it was heartbreaking for me to see, not only as a clinician, but as somebody who studied immunology undergraduate, graduate, and postgraduate. So I could see what was going on. I was sending out emails to my friends on prevention. This is March of 2020. But then we came back, and my, my staff, they were terrified. And, and so I explained to them, I said, hey, you've been working in spit and blood, which HIV hepatitis B, and tuberculosis every day of your lives. I said, if I have a choice between COVID and one of those, I'll take COVID. I'm sorry. But plus, our immune systems are up. So when we saw all of this happening, what happened is that I said to my staff, I said, nobody is open. We've got patients that are in pain. We need to go ahead and get moving. So if you're afraid, you can go home and take your checks and go on unemployment. Or 
we can stay and we can help people. And they said, Doc, if you're not afraid, we're not afraid. So we stayed, and I put a big banner outside the office down the street on 113th Street. I said, we are open for emergencies. We saw patients that were other people's patients, not that I was trying to get those patients, but I said, we can help you. And so we went ahead and we served those patients, and it was very heartbreaking to me. Over that period of time, I saw fear increase. The more that, we, that came out on the news and the more people that were tied to the TV, the more that they became afraid. I have been wearing a mask since 1985, and I wrote the DOI over at MacDill Air Force Base on infection control after HIV came out. Some of you may remember that. So those kinds of things, I really knew. And, and so I can tell you that an N95 mask has a point three micron opening, a virus is 0.1 micron. Well, hello, you can wear a mask all day long. It's not going to make a difference. What's going to make a difference is us empowering you to take care of your own health. And how can you do that? You can eat well. You can make sure that you interact. If you lock yourself at home, you're actually more vulnerable to any virus, and that includes the flu. So all of the people that are out riding their bikes with masks on are actually making things worse. So I'm hoping that as things go ahead and the onion gets peeled back and people realize that vaccines are not the answer, and by the way, the mRNA shot is not a vaccine, and I will say that, it is not. It's 30 billion spike proteins with each shot in injected into your arm to create an immune response. And that's what it is. And that being said, once you go ahead and you get on the vaccine um, wheel, then you have to keep taking vaccines because you switch yourself from Th1 to Th2 immunity. Long story, if you ever want to talk about it, we know what the difference is. But in any case, my encouragement to you is get back to what mom and dad taught you. Learn the things that you know to empower yourself, and you won't need a healthcare surrogate because you're going to live till 100 and you're going to feel good. So, sorry about that to talk long, but I took it over from you, great. Deb, so you didn't, didn't have to do it. I think that's great information. <laughs> Does anybody have any other questions that they would like to ask? We will certainly be around. Um, I'd like to uh, remind everyone of all of the resources that are right here in this room. Make sure you get around to all of our tables and talk to everyone. And um, if you need anything at all, just shout. Thank you so much.